Welcome to part 7 of this week's online lecture. In part 7, we will briefly look at the ramifications of this spatial quantization. There is a selection rule associated with mj as well, and that is that delta mj, the change in the mj quantum number, must be equal to 0 or plus or minus 1. However, as the rotational energy does not depend on the mj quantum number, this selection rule has no effect on the spectrum. When could we have an exception though? We can have an exception if my molecule is not in an isotopically even spatial environment. If there is a direction applied, if my molecule knows what the z-axis is. But how can I let my molecule know what the z-axis is? I can do it by applying an electric or magnetic field in a particular direction. If I apply an electric field in a particular direction, there is going to be an interaction between my dipole moment and the electric field. And the interaction now does depend on the spatial orientation of the molecule. And so the energy of the system will depend on the mj quantum number and the selection rule with regard to mj will affect the rotational spectrum. The lifting of the degeneracy can be seen in a special effect known as the Stark effect. Say that I was in the j equals 7 level, therefore I could have 2j plus 1 levels, that is 15 possible levels which will be degenerate if there is no electric field applied. As soon as I apply an electric field however, the energy levels are split, and if mj is equal to plus or minus 7, the energy level will be here at the bottom. If it's equal to plus or minus 6, it will be here, and so on, all the way up to the top, where mj is equal to 0. So we've lifted the degeneracy, and now the fact that delta mj is equal to 0 or plus or minus 1 becomes important. One of the reasons why this is quite useful is that the energy of my level now depends on both my j level and the mj level. So the rotational energy is equal to b times j into j plus 1, as before, plus it's got this additional term here. And this additional term depends on the electric field strength and also the dipole moment, plus this parameter that depends on the j quantum number and the mj quantum number of the system. This a parameter depends on both j and mj in a rather complicated manner. Because the energy here depends on the electric field and the dipole moment of the molecule, this is quite a useful effect in order to measure the dipole moment of the molecule. So again, that is the reason why we do spectroscopy, not to create a pretty spectrum, but to use the spectra to determine something about the molecule, whether it is the bond length or bond angle. But in this case, we can use the Stark effect to determine its dipole moment, and we can do so quite accurately. So what about the intensities of the rotational lines? Remember, we spoke about this in our general discussion of spectroscopy, that the spectral line intensity is controlled both by the transition probability and the population of the initial state. And the degeneracy that we've just been looking at is going to affect the population of the initial state. If you've got more levels of a particular energy, the molecule has more chances to have that energy. So therefore, you'll get more molecules in those levels. It is kind of an entropy effect that is going on here. The more that your level is degenerate, the more molecules you will find in that level. So it doesn't just depend on how high the energy is above the reference energy, it also depends on how many levels there are at that particular energy. If we actually do the quantum mechanics and calculate the transition probability for a rotational system, that transitional probability is pretty much the same for all transitions. You would not notice any effects unless you were doing some really high quality spectroscopy. So we can largely ignore the quantum mechanical effect here of changing transition probability. However, the population of the states changes dramatically. This is the Boltzmann distribution law. This expression relates the number of molecules in the end state 
compared to the number of molecules in the M state. The ratio depends on the ratio of the degeneracies in the N state over the degeneracy in the M state. So if the N state is more degenerate than the M state, there is going to be more molecules in the N state. To complete the expression, the ratio of the degeneracy is multiplied by the exponential of minus delta E over KT, where delta E is the difference in energy between the N state and the M state, and KT is the amount of thermal energy available to excite molecules into any excited state. So let's have a look at how the degeneracy is going to change the population distribution. It frequently makes sense to reference the population to the ground state, the J equals zero state. That is, make the ground state our reference state. This makes our distribution somewhat simpler, because the J equals zero is not degenerate. So the degeneracy in the denominator disappears. Remember the degeneracy of any level is equal to 2J plus 1. So therefore, the ratio between NJ, the number of molecules in the J state, to N0, the number of molecules in the ground state, is going to be equal to 2J plus 1 times the exponential of minus J into J plus 1 H C tilde B tilde, this is the energy difference between the J level and the J equals 0 level, over KT. So this is my expression. So I've got two terms to consider. I can see that as J increases, this 2J plus 1 term, the degeneracy, is increasing. But as J increases, this exponential term decreases because of the negative sign. So I have two competing effects as J increases. The degeneracy means that I should expect more molecules in higher J levels, but the exponential term is telling me that I should see fewer molecules as J increases. So how does this all pan out? Well, I'm going to get a balance between these two terms at some value of J. There will be a maximum. And you can appreciate this by doing some simple calculus. I can simply differentiate this expression with respect to J. When the expression is a maximum, this gradient is equal to zero. The differential is not too tricky. If you solve this, we can find the maximum J value. And the maximum J value is approximately equal to this expression. The fact is that when we differentiate it, we are assuming that J is continuous, but we know that that is not true as J is always an integer. So that means there is going to be a bit of an issue with regards to that. So when I set it equal to zero, the J max that I will come up with is a non-integer. It's got to be an integer, so I've got to decide which it should be. I could simply substitute it into this equation and find out which it could, would be. But why bother? What is important about this? The fact is, it depends on temperature. If I know what the rotational constant is, I can get that from the space between my spectral lines. Identifying which spectral line has the greatest intensity, which is the J-max line, I can use this information to determine this temperature at which the molecule is emitting or absorbing radiation. I can determine the temperature of my sample. In the laboratory, that is not a particularly useful thing because it would be a lot easier to measure the temperature using a thermometer. But what if the molecule is in the atmosphere, or even further away in space? Information about the intensities of the spectral lines can be used to determine temperature. But let's have a closer look at the effect on intensities. What will the spectrum look like? It will look like this. In this expression, I can identify J max, the most intense spectral line. The first line here is the transition from 0 to 1 the second from 1 to 2, the third from 2 to 3, and so J max is equal to 2. Note that J max is the initial rotational state during the transition. If I substitute it into this expression, I can determine what the temperature is. This is the end of part 7 of this week's online lecture. Please continue on to part 8.